It is now time for questions to the Minister for the Economy and can I advise members that question number five has been withdrawn. I call Nicola Brogan. Question number one, please. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. My department is working closely with further education colleges on the provision and distribution of this funding to full-time enrolled learners throughout Northern Ireland. Full-time further education students who have been marked present uh, at least once on an e-register during the month of January 2021 will receive a one-off cash payment of £60 into their bank account to offset data costs during the COVID-19 pandemic. Within this allocation, 500 iPads or similar devices have also been put on order and will be loaned to further education students requiring online access. I call Nicola Brogan for supplementary. Um, students in rural areas such as my constituency in West Tyrone have struggled to um, complete learning and remote learning due to poor broadband connection. In terms of digital hardship scheme, um, which Sorry, will additional mobile data allowances be given to students who need these to complete their studies and their online exams? Can I uh, thank the member uh, for her question? Um, as I indicated in my previous answer, um, part of this uh, particular 1.7 million allocation will be used uh, to help uh, young students uh, buy access uh, to further data. This should help with uh, digital poverty alongside um, the additional um, iPads or computers uh, that are required uh, for young people. In addition to this, uh, throughout uh, the course of the pandemic, um, an additional 4.8 million of uh, funding has been uh, provided to colleges earlier uh, in the financial year to buy, uh, uh, also to buy IT equipment. Uh, and some colleges have obtained data, SIM cards for students to access broadband, and to date, uh, 1,197 of these cards have been made available to further education students. I hope uh, that this does alleviate uh, the members' concern, because I do understand that this has been a very difficult time for young students um, who have missed out on that college experience um, and have had to rely on online teaching. And no matter how good that is, um, the, 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 even the loneliness and, and remoteness of that um, has been difficult for young people. I call Mark Durham. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Has the Minister engaged with network providers on mobile data and does she know how many more masts and where across the north these masts should go or must go for full mobile connectivity? The telecommunications part of my department continuously um, um, is uh, in contact with uh, mobile providers uh, and particularly um, as we move to the rollout of 5G, which is very important for the connectivity uh, across Northern Ireland. Um, I do not know uh, the detail around the masks to hand, but I will, of course, be happy to write to the member. Moving on, I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy <coughs> Speaker. Question two, please. Can I thank the member uh, for his question? Project Stratum will utilise public funding gained through the DUP Confidence and Supply Agreement, together with investment from Fibrous Networks, to deliver gigabit capable broadband infrastructure to more than 76,000 primarily rural premises across Northern Ireland, including, I would say, 4,236 uh, premises in the member's own constituency. It is the biggest infrastructure project ever undertaken in Northern Ireland, and for the members' further information, work is already underway in Killyleigh to provide this important connectivity. Following contract award in November 2020, the deployment of infrastructure commenced immediately. Work is underway in the first five deployment areas, Coal Island, Killyleigh, Ballycastle, Kilkeel and Castlewellan. 
Fibrous networks have planted in excess of 374 poles, installed 8.2 uh, kilometres of duct and completed 63 kilometres of fibre cable. The fact that these build activities have already commenced at this stage of the project is a significant achievement given that network providers typ typically uh, use the first six to nine months uh, for uh, planning. Therefore, while we had anticipated that this period would be required for network design, it is now expected that the first premises will be live in the first quarter of 2021, and over 19,000 of that 76,000 will have been passed by the end of this year. Fibrous Networks has advised my department that the COVID-19 restrictions has had some uh, delay uh, due to additional paperwork and the challenges that it presented. This is a good news story for Northern Ireland, uh, building um, the connectivity of the future for the economy. I call Mike Nesbitt for supplementary. I thank the Minister for, for, for that response. In terms of a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, could she inform the House what are the current threats to Project Stratum? Project Stratum uh, continues to be rolled out. Um, and uh, we will be uh, looking at, for example, those projects or those premises um, that are not within the scope of Project Stratum, uh, but there are currently no threats to the rollout of Project Stratum. I call Declan McAleer. Thank you. And I, I share the Minister's comments that this is a good news story, that this is a very good news story. Um, the Minister will be aware that in the uh, assessment for uh, broadband, the initial figure which was provided that there are about 100,000 premises in the north that don't have access to broadband, or certainly of, a, of decent quality broadband. But the figure that quoted now for projects driving is 76,000 premises. That's a gap of over 20,000. Could the Minister tell us, has she had any engagement with uh, the Project Stratum team and indeed with DCMS and Westminster to look at a means to try to reach those premises that, that are not currently in the Project Stratum intervention area? Graham Augut. <clears throat> Can I thank the member for his question? It is a good news story for Northern Ireland. As we have seen uh, during the pandemic, uh, connectivity is key. Uh, particularly for rural communities, but particularly for all communities. Um, and it is key to the uh, objectives uh, of uh, growing the economy in Northern Ireland and that regionally balanced economy that we all seek. Um, currently, there are about 3% of premises that should have been within the target intervention area that are currently out of scope of Project Stratum. We have already had discussions with uh, the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and with Fibrous Networks, um, and we are working to identify the solutions and costs to bring these uh, premises into the intervention area. And I will update the House as soon as I have further information on that. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, and thank you, Minister. Minister, um, in addition to the welcome um, connectivity which Project Stratum will give, BT recently estimated that Northern Ireland is one of the most digitally connected regions in the United Kingdom. What actions are you taking along with Invest Northern Ireland and Intertrade Ireland to promote Northern Ireland as a digitally engaged community to enhance business, particularly in relation to our unique position in relation to both the GB and the EU markets? Well, of course, the member makes a, a, a very important point um, and um, makes the point that many times we use uh, when we are talking to investors who are thinking about coming to Northern Ireland. It is an absolute um, delight to, to be able to say that um, for those uh, tech and digital companies who are already in Northern Ireland, they find Northern Ireland innovative, hardworking, solution-driven, and many of them, while completely operating for the past year at home, have been winning contracts with their larger um, home markets in North America. Uh, productivity has increased, um, and they are an absolute credit um, to Northern Ireland. This is one of the spaces where we think that we can grow the economy further. For Belfast um, and the Greater Belfast region to be recognised as, uh, you know, 
one of the most exciting digital hubs in the whole of the United Kingdom is extremely, extremely important. However, I would have to advise uh, the member as well that while all of these things are hugely important, and these are connected with the service economy, which of course um, is not uh, subject uh, to the rigours uh, of the protocol, um, we must fix uh, the impact of the protocol on Northern Ireland. To be disconnected from our biggest market is a huge disadvantage to Northern Ireland. And for those who continue to blindly support the protocol, then they will be uh, turning their, their eyes away from the impact on businesses, on families, on jobs, and the potential for the economy in Northern Ireland to grow. I call Thomas Buchanan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. And Minister, thank you for your answers so far on this issue. And being from a rural area, I know what the difficulties that are being faced by the rural communities with regards to poor connectivity whenever it comes to broadband. And I hope that the project Statham will address those issues whenever it's uh, finally rolled out. But can I just ask you that why are areas of greatest need not prioritised in this programme? Uh, obviously, if we take the rural areas and, and out into the rural communities that are really affected at this time, why are they not prioritised and what impact would that have uh, uh, right across Northern Ireland? Um, can I thank <coughs> the member for his question? He makes a very, very important uh, point. And can I point out to him for information for this House that West Tyrone, in West Tyrone alone, 9,591 um, premises will be um, impacted by Project Stratum and will have um, the superfast broadband um, that uh, they so need if we are to build that regionally balanced economy that we all seek. In relation to the substance of his question, um, when um, the, the contract and the tenders for this um, were uh, done, it was um, made clear that we had to roll it out in a way that made the best use of the monies to encompass the most houses that we could get into uh, the project within Northern Ireland. Hence, uh, the construct uh, of uh, the programme so far. I look forward uh, to uh, those first 19,000 uh, houses being connected uh, by the end of this year and shortly in the spring of this year the first live connection. That will be quite a moment for the largest ever infrastructure project for Northern Ireland. Moving on, I call Paul Free. Question number three, Minister. Can I thank the member uh, for his question? I have made clear that at all times I will act in the interests of the people of Northern Ireland and our local economy in accordance with my ministerial responsibilities, the Code and the statement of the 2nd of February by our party leader, which I know, like me, the Honourable Member fully supports. We have indicated to our own government that they need to act, but we also need to send a message to the Government of the Irish Republic that North-South relationships are also impacted by the implementation of a protocol for which they are cheerleaders and which does real damage to the agreements they purport to uphold, along with the real damage it does to our businesses, consumers and communities here in Northern Ireland. We can and we will not continue to act as though relationships have not been impacted by their actions. We will consider each matter on its merits not doing anything, of course, that negatively impacts on Northern Ireland, but it cannot be business as usual for North-South relations uh, because of the issues that flow from the protocol. Call Popery. I thank the Minister for her very clear answer. Uh, can I ask then, would the Minister agree with me that the protocol is causing significant economic and societal harm in Northern Ireland? Does she further agree that it cannot be business as usual in respect of North-South relationships, given the horrific and unhealthy attitude of the Republic of Ireland's government towards Northern Ireland during the EU-UK negotiations, and indeed the actions of the NIO in changing the Belfast Agreement regarding consent, and will she assure the House that she will only partake in North-South activity where there is a clear advantage for Northern Ireland, its businesses and its people? 
I uh, can indeed assure the House uh, that that will indeed uh, be my uh, position. I uh, in no way want to negatively impact upon Northern Ireland on the stability uh, of its people, on its political process, um, or indeed, um, importantly for me in my role, on its economy. However, I do recognise um, and I have uh, spent many, many times explaining and going through the difficulties uh, that the protocol represents um, for uh, Northern Ireland, that rupture within the UK's internal market that the protocol has brought about. And I find it uh, somewhat disconcerting that uh, nationalist politicians and cheerleaders from the uh, Republic of Ireland uh, simply refuse to acknowledge the folly of the protocol um, in uh, the north-south relations, in east -west, um, the east-west trade, um, and also um, for communities and individuals and families. So let me give you um, some of the issues that I have been dealing with over the last uh, number of weeks. And these are very real issues that impact on families across Northern Ireland. So we have the issue of an e-commerce market within the United Kingdom that is broken, parcels that can't arrive. And of course, it's easy to make sort of snide or remarks on Twitter about parcels, but the real impact is on families and businesses across Northern Ireland. My department has been following um, the e-commerce issue very closely. We've been tracking what has happened to a number, over 100 businesses um, that did send uh, parcels to Northern Ireland. Um, out of those six weeks into the protocol, only 143 of those businesses have, have made any changes. The Minister's time is up. Um, yes, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, but what we um, are very clear is that there are significant challenges and significant difficulties. I, I call Kiva Archibald. And I, I thank the Minister for her responses so far. It's quite clear that Brexiteers argued for Brexit on the basis of fantasies and mistruths and ignored the concerns and fears that have now been realised that Brexit would bring only disruption and difficulties. A report last week by manufacturing Can we have NI a question, please? highlighted that the majority of businesses here want practical solutions to make the protocol work. Does the Minister not agree that her time would be better spent engaging with those businesses and promoting our valuable access to the European market rather than engaging in silly political stunts? Um, I, I will uh, remind uh, the member in this House that I, in my former role as a member of the European Parliament and as a minister, have consistently warned of the dangers of the protocol. And all those parties in this House that want the rigorous implementation of the protocol do so at the expense of families and businesses within Northern Ireland. Um, I am not in the, the uh, position of stunts. And if I was, I need only to look at the party opposite and the breaking of walls at this imaginary border that we have had and all of the stunts that have gone over. If there are stunts in this house, this party has the monopoly on them. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, one um, important way that we could ease east-west disruption caused by Brexit would be through the signing of an EU-UK agreement on SPS, specifically a veterinary standards agreement. Switzerland has one of those, Norway has one of those, they are both outside the European Union. If the Minister is serious about wanting to ease east-west disruption, will she commit here and now to calling on the UK Government to sign a veterinary agreement and to uh, align uh, in, much closer, uh, in a much closer way with the EU on veterinary standards. That's a practical way we can ease disruption. Is she willing to make that call here and now on the UK government? 
Well, of course, the member is well aware that the kind of Swiss type arrangement that he talks about requires the whole of the UK to slavishly follow um, EU rules uh, in every respect. Um, I used to, uh, in the European Parliament, hear them say, you know, that if, if the Swiss wanted to turn right, they had to ask Brussels permission to do so. As someone who um, voted for Brexit, who believes in the sovereignty of the United Kingdom, then I, um, you know, will always want the United Kingdom to act as one. I regret that our Prime Minister imposed the protocol, cheered by many in this House to the detriment of Northern Ireland. It is up now to the Prime Minister to fix the problem that he created, to um, take up that uh, duty that he has to United Kingdom citizens here in Northern Ireland and remove the barriers to trade, particularly um, in relation um, to um, the issue of SPS agreements. But perhaps you know, the member should also reflect, when he is cheerleading for the protocol, um, what really the SDLP want about this. So we cheerlead for the protocol, yet the SDLP reader writes to me in my department asking me if I'm going to design a scheme and provide a financial assistance to businesses who are experiencing additional costs from the protocol. I call Steve Egan. Indeed, may I thank the Minister for her remarks so far. And the Minister may not be aware, but this morning Mario Sefcovic has said that he will be meeting with Northern Ireland businesses and civil society this week. I believe it's on Thursday. Do you think it is dis discourteous to say the least? that Maria Sekovic is not listening to unionism, and particular political unionism, in our steadfast opposition to this very unequal Northern Ireland Protocol. I think that um, where the European Commissioner is reflects, I think, uh, um, denial that many in this House have, that uh, certainly um, our own government have in changing the consent mechanism to the Protocol. Uh, and indeed a position that uh, the European Union have long had. Um, I think it is um, disingenuous, the politest and mildest way I can put it, to call for the full implementation of the Belfast Agreement in all its parts and then change the rules of the Belfast Agreement around consent because their pet project might not gain consent in this House. I think it is time that nationalist politicians here in Dublin, in London um, and in uh, the European Union actually listened to the fact that those delicate balances created by the Belfast Agreement have been completely thrown out the window and that political unionism is united in opposing the impact and the protocol in Northern Ireland. Moving on, I call Andrew Muir. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the member for his question? I continue to work with the Finance Minister on the replacement of EU structural funds. The Department for the Economy has a clear interest in the EU replacement funding, given that ESF and ERDF programmes have historically funded substantial activity within our policy remit, such as economic development, energy, skills and apprenticeships. A successful bid in January monitoring provided my department with domestic funding for existing ESF projects within the current financial year. This effectively enables my department to defer spending European Commission funds uh, of around 26 million until 2022-23, when uh, otherwise that funding would have run out. The mechanism for extending this ES activity is currently being explored, and I hope to make a formal announcement in the coming weeks. This welcome outcome provides my department with additional time to develop appropriate succession programmes and secure the necessary funding for these valuable interventions. I call Andrew Muir for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Northern Ireland is in a very different place now and we need to plan for the future. Can the Minister please perhaps clarify the situation with regards to her attitude towards this future? Is the party, the Minister, going to work with the protocol and look to find solutions with the rest of us, 
or is it turning your back on reality, on North-South cooperation and on economic success? I can assure you that my face is firmly planted towards the future. I'm currently working um, on future uh, interventions for the Northern Ireland economy because I want a successful, stable, prosperous Northern Ireland where all its citizens can live and feel valued. That is an important point of principle uh, for me. I, however, um, and I can understand pro-protocol parties uh, making a bit of a song and dance about this because kind of gone away from rigorous implementation to a few teething problems, etc., etc. And I can understand the member's point. But let's be absolutely, absolutely clear. Our biggest market is GB. We sell more into the Great Britain market than we do into the Republic of Ireland the rest of the EU and the rest of the world put together. Those, it is absolutely imperative that we fix the fissure that has now developed in the United Kingdom's internal market so that we can help Northern Ireland to progress. And if I may, Mr. Speaker, because this is an important point, for many firms, they will not know what their future holds like because they may rely on supply chains that bring goods from the EU, which then have to come to Northern Ireland um, as part of the manufacturing or retail processes. And those goods, because they traverse through GB, may be hit by tariffs if they are at risk of falling into the uh, single market. We need to have clarity for our businesses. And before we can move on the, that uh, interruption to the UK's internal market needs to be fixed. I call Christopher Stelford. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, would my friend agree with me that it is bizarre to be in a situation where political parties in this House will defend arrangements that will impose additional costs on families and firms? Would she agree with me that what we are dealing with here is a group of Belfast masochists defending Brussels sadists? Um, yes, that's quite the description. But what, what I find, um, what we have here, is this kind of bury your head in the sand um, attitude. And of course, it's very common in Brussels, because in Brussels, the political project comes above everything else. We've seen that in relation to vaccines. We've seen that the political project trumps people's lives in relation to the vaccine supply. And it trumps everything in relation to Northern Ireland. I don't believe that Brussels really cares about Northern Ireland. Um, it has used it shamelessly as a bargaining chip for years. I call Emma Sheeran. Uh, Minister, it's clear that our uh, departure from the EU has led, has led to quite a lot of uh, losses in terms of structural funds. And uh, I know that your own department has apparently lost some 70 million in terms of uh, the European Regional Development Fund and, and European Social Fund. And I know that uh, things between yourselves and the British government maybe aren't great at the minute, you are on somewhat of a break. But can you give us assurances that you have sought uh, clarification from the British government that this funding is going to be replaced by them? And have you, have you uh, received that confirmation? Can I thank the member uh, for her question? Um, and she takes us into the territory of the replacement programmes uh, for European funding and how uh, that will work uh, for the future. Um, it is important that we um, address the issues around apprenticeships. I don't think anyone, whatever political persuasion in this House, would deny the fact that I have absolutely championed young people and apprentices at every opportunity uh, within Northern Ireland. It's important that we look um, at young people who are in our training networks um, so they have a good start in life. And I will continue to work to identify that programme. But I am looking forward to, and I think that um, our government needs to give us greater clarity on the successor programme to these, the Shared Prosperity Fund, um, and how we can work uh, within the parameters of that, not just to get uh, additional funding um, for the needs in relation to training um, and uh, apprenticeships, etc., but in relation to real investment in Northern Ireland that recognises the needs and priorities of the Northern Ireland Executive.
I call Jim Allister. And the former First Minister, uh, Peter Robinson, very perceptively said, you cannot try to ditch the protocol and administer it at the same time. Which choice does our economy minister prefer? That clearly is not related to the question over the minister if she wishes to make a response. I will, of course, make a response because I think it is an important one. And uh, perhaps the tone of Mr. Allister's question reflects his position all along that he doesn't want to see Stormont uh, succeed or um, to have uh, the institutions here. I have said very clearly in my first answer to the question that I will act at all times in the interests of the people of Northern Ireland and in uh, conjunction with my ministerial responsibilities. I take those very seriously and I will do that. But I will continue to oppose the protocol that has brought such damage to the economy in Northern Ireland. And we are only seeing um, at the, at the start of this year, for the first six weeks of this year, we've been focused, uh, for, and most of our time has been focused on the issue of movement of goods. Firms across Northern Ireland are about to put in what they call supplementary declarations. Those supplementary declarations will deal with the issue of tariffs. I expect to see significant disruption at this level as well. And that is the end of our period of time for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Nicola Brogan. Minister, the recent announcement of the £500 COVID disruption payment was welcomed by many um, higher education students. However, full-time um, students studying in further education colleges, part-time students, um, international students, students in the north studying in the 26 counties and students in the north studying in Britain have all been excluded. Uh, Minister, will you address um, these inequalities and ensure that students who are currently excluded will be entitled to this payment? Can I thank uh, the member for a question? She raises a, an important and, dare say, a topical question <laughs> for the moment uh, and the time that's in it. I was delighted that I was able to announce a package of almost £38 million of support uh, for students uh, within Northern Ireland. That support will, um, as the member rightly says, um, deal with uh, the £500 individual payments to all students. It will increase the hardship funds that are available to our institutions uh, by another £8.5 million including a focus on mental health of young students uh, and the issues around digital uh, poverty that many of our young students uh, are facing. I recognise, and that is why I asked for and gained uh, a support package that is probably the most generous of any part of our United Kingdom. Um, I obviously, um, there are about 15,000 students from Northern Ireland who study in institutions throughout uh, the rest of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. I, uh, our department holds no database for those students uh, and I also have no legal remit to uh, ask uh, universities or institutions uh, in the rest of Great Britain uh, to authorise payments to those students. That is not within my legal purvey at uh, this moment in time. But those students are not without help. And just as uh, EU students or Scottish or Welsh students can gain help through the schemes here in Northern Ireland, those students who are studying in Great Britain will gain similar help through the schemes that are there. And just recently, Scotland announced an additional 30 million for hardship, Wales 40 million for hardship, and England 50 million for hardship. And I would encourage those students to use the schemes that are in uh, the particular institutions that they belong to. I call Nicola Brogan for supplementary. Jeremy, I'll get last one, Carla. Minister, back in November, you told the Assembly that your department would be reviewing the level of support provided to postgraduate um, students. These students don't receive maintenance grants or loans, um, and it's um, a major barrier for those on low income. Minister, can you provide a date for when this consultation and postgraduate funding will be launched, please? Um, yes, um, well, I can't provide you the exact date, um, but I will be this afternoon discussing this very issue with uh, the senior team in my department, and we hope to launch the consultation in the very near future. I call Christopher Stelford. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, can I ask my honourable friend what plans she is putting in place for the reopening of the economy? Again, uh, can I thank the member uh, for his, uh, his question. Um, I think that we all in this House must be rightly proud uh, of the way that our uh, health service has responded uh, to what has been the most uh, difficult period in our history. Um, and also responded in uh, their vaccine rollout. And I am hopeful uh, because uh, we have been managing uh, to get significant numbers of our people uh, within the vaccine programme, and this is a credit uh, to those uh, who are organising it, uh, Patricia Donnelly and her team. And I think we should all acknowledge that uh, as a matter of fact today. However, um, as we progress, we need to make sure that we open our economy safely um, and that we open our economy for the long term and that we break this cycle that we've been in of open and shut, which is so destroying to so many businesses. I had a, a meeting um, on Friday with my local chamber in Banbridge, um, and it is very disturbing to hear how so many businesses are literally hanging on with their fingertips um, at this particular time. No amount of schemes that we can devise or no amount of help that we can give is a substitute for an open economy that is trading freely. In the next number uh, of weeks, I'll be working with the task force um, in uh, the TEO, but I will also be bringing forward my plans uh, for economic recovery and, most importantly, plans uh, that I hope the executive will respond to for a skills uh, budget for Northern Ireland, which will um, not just open the economy, but will help that economy to trade successfully with appropriate skills. Christopher Selfer. Uh, thank you. And speaking as someone that's been in hospital three times in the last year, I absolutely associate myself with your comments in relation to the National Health Service. Can I urge the Minister to be bold in pushing for the fullest possible opening up of our economy? Because it is utterly soul-destroying for people that are trying to run businesses in particular, that every time there appears to be light at the end of the tunnel, up pop some public figures demanding that we build more tunnel. I absolutely agree with the member in relation to his very last comment that messaging is very important and can have a significant impact on businesses. I had a meeting um, with uh, some business uh, organisations and was very disturbed to hear because of the issues and the problems and the longevity of um, the, the pandemic that so many of them had mental health problems, some had contemplated suicide. This is no way to run our society, and it is very difficult, and messaging is key in all of that. Um, yes, I think that we will want uh, to open up our economy, we want to do it safely, um, and we want to do it um, with an as swift a way as the transmission of the disease allows us to do that. I will, of course, be working with colleagues in order to bring that about. But I have to say that I think that this House could support us. There are some things that I think our national government can do, and that is the extension of furlough. There are um, particularly aerospace and um, tourism and hospitality where the tail of recovery will be long and troublesome, and I think the extension of furlough is key. For um, tourism and hospitality, uh, extending the cut in the VAT rate is also key. And I know that my party colleagues at Westminster are taking up all of these issues, but it is important that we send that united voice uh, on this very, very important issue. And I call William Irwin. Mr Deputy Speaker, <coughs> would the Minister agree with me that parties who enthusiastically call for the full implementation of the protocol bear some responsibility for the disruption to uh, cause to business and consumers. Many of us have, have been contacted by constituents angry that they can no longer receive parcels from GB. Has the Minister raised this with the UK Government? I thank the Member for his question. I have raised uh, the e-commerce uh, market in the United Kingdom on a number of occasions uh, with both BEZ, um, my reporting department, and indeed with Michael Gove. Uh, who is undertaking most of the protocol issues. 
It is absolutely vital that we have a UK e-commerce market that thrives and that every business and individual in Northern Ireland can be part of in an equal way right across the United Kingdom. That currently is not happening. Um, and we currently have significant disruption with firms who simply um, will not commit uh, to trading with Northern Ireland. That may be because they don't know uh, the, the changed circumstances, it may be because that uh, information came too late, or it may be indeed because the so-called grace period that Michael Gove announced runs out on the 31st of May. These are the problems of the protocol. For those who sit on the opposite benches and deny them, then that is for them to explain to families and individuals and businesses across Northern Ireland. I call William Irwin for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for her response? Will the, I'm sure the, is the Minister aware that many hauliers are facing very difficult and challenging times. One haulier yesterday with 20, 20 trailers sitting in England can't get loads back because they can't, businesses will not supply. Uh, this is a big issue for hauliers. Many who are making a loss this last four weeks or five from the protocol commenced. Yes, the issue of hauliers, um, of course, is hugely problematic um, for Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, indeed, I was talking to one haulage company in my own constituency, um, where they admitted that they had no, they had no alternative but to raise uh, prices. Those prices will, in turn, be passed on to consumers and be passed on to businesses in Northern Ireland. The protocol inevitably brings less choice and higher prices, um, and that's just an inevitable uh, outworking uh, of the protocol. I also was talking to um, Hospitality Ulster, and, and, and they were actually saying that um, if we consider things like export health certificates due to run out uh, in another few weeks, Grace period and chilled foods. If we consider the fact that the food service industry is only operating currently around a third of the level because of the shutdown that it would normally operate on, that the protocol problems will become more intense and deeper as time goes on. I call Sinead Bradley. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for West Tyrone for raising my questions on students, but I will use the opportunity for a different question. Minister, I listened attentively uh, to your answer to question three and about the North-South ministerial meetings, and you said that you would consider each matter on its merit. Does the minister accept that following your pledge of office, it is your duty to participate in North-South ministerial meetings and not your choice? The member uh, does not remember the first part of my answer to that question, which said that I would at all times act uh, within my ministerial responsibilities and the Code of Office. I call Sinead Bradley for supplement. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that clarification, because there is a duty on you, as there is on all ministers, to represent all the people of Northern Ireland. And in that vein, I would ask, moving forward, what, what plans does she have to ensure equality is offered to the people of South Down, who have been for a very long time at the latter end of any work through Invest NI and securing inward investment and jobs? What plans has she to rectify that situation? Um, I, of course, will write to the member individually about the issue of South Down, but I crave equality for the citizens of Northern Ireland, equality within the UK's internal market, equality within the UK's e-commerce market, that all citizens in Northern Ireland are treated on the same basis as citizens right across the United Kingdom. This protocol interrupts that provides a huge fissure in relation to that, um, and equality is high on my agenda. I call Pam Cameron, and you may not have time for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister if she agrees with me that reintroducing Click and Collect um, for all retail stores would go in some way in helping businesses who um, have been losing out to trade um, because uh, they have been forced to close while larger retail outlets have been allowed to remain open? This is, um, issue is a source of great frustration to me. I have now brought two papers uh, on Click and Collect uh, to the Executive, and so far we have had one discussion and no decision. 
If we want to reduce uh, the inequality in how small independent retailers are treated vis-à-vis -vis the big uh, multinationals, we have to move to allow them to trade in some respect or other, and that inevitably will include uh, click and collect. I again will put forward my paper for discussion on this particular matter on Thursday, and I hope it can be resolved. And that is the end of our period of questions to the Minister for the Economy. Uh, I would ask men members to take their ease for a few moments and anyone who is leaving the chamber to respect social distancing.